discover new oceans unless you have the courage to lose sight of the shore. Genius is making complex ideas seem simple. Education is the most powerful weapon to change the world. All right, we have the great privilege. I am with a good friend, a former colleague at High Tech High. We uh, were in the same master's program together, and now we're in different parts of the world. I'm in Hong Kong. She's in Denmark. And uh, why don't you introduce yourself, Lonnie, and what you do? Yeah, my name is Lonnie Belkust. I am a founder and CEO of a company called Imaginif, and we support schools with using project-based learning. But like Kyle said, I was uh, actually yeah, a teacher for a lot of years at High Tech High and actually a very traditional school before that and fell in love with project-based learning and authentic work with kids. Yeah, basically at High Tech High, that love story began. All right. So like before we go into ju- like the shift we're going to talk about, like what you said, it's a love story for PBL. So like what made it a love story? Like why make that switch from where you're at in a traditional school? What was so cool about it? Well, I think the first thing was that I was I was feeling really frustrated at my old school. I felt like no matter how much I tried to engage kids or like, you know, dress up and put on costumes or like, you know, just like acted in front of them that they still just weren't that interested. I could entertain them for an hour, but to really get them to own their learning, I mean, it just wasn't happening. And then uh, I heard about High Tech High from like a friend of a friend. And the first time I walked into a High Tech High school, if you've ever been there, you just know that you're just kind of hit with this overwhelming sense of like pride and student work and art and just beauty. In, in the work that's done. Um, and kind of after that point, I knew I could never go back and see teaching and learning in the same way. I knew that I had to, I had to figure out like what project-based learning was and, and why it was so meaningful to kids. Mm. And that kind of launched the journey into the High Tech High Graduate School of Education and then working there myself. Wow. Yeah. So it's been a long journey of many years. Started with that initial observation at High Tech High. So yeah. like for all the new people who are watching, maybe who are new to PBL, does that mean it's going to take 10 to 12 years or, you know, to get it, <laughs> to get it down to master it or? <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I think a lot of it depends on on uh, on where you are as a teacher and and what you're driving towards. I mean, I think even after 10, 15 years, you're still trying to find new ways to engage kids and really make learning authentic to them because every new group of kids that comes in, like the learning is new to them. So so I think it's it's something that keeps the profession really fresh. Like you never mm-hmm. kind of get bored of it, I think, and you never also get to a position where you're just kind of doing the same projects over and over. And if you start getting there, you can always push yourself to, to design different, differently. So yeah, it might take 10, 15 years, but it might just be a, a lifelong journey. Uh, at least I think for me, it is. Well, it's good. You still look like very young. So I guess 10 to 15 years Thank you. PBL <laughs> is what keeps you young. <laughs> um, so let's just kind of dive right into it and like look at projects because I think really a lot of people are watching this or trying to get some nuggets of wisdom and how to make some of these shifts to be more effective project teachers. And more specifically, I know you've done a lot of work around interdisciplinary type of planning and project design. So rather than just asking you about that, I want to just ask what's usually the starting point for a project. Like, let's say you do want, is it something that one teacher then starts and then reaches out to another one um, later on and says, hey, you're an art teacher, maybe you can help? Or what's the starting point for project design when you're in a team? Yeah, I think it it depends a little bit like where you are and what the possibilities are. At High Tech High, we had a lot of opportunities where we had common planning time, for example. So the, the opportunity to sit down with a colleague that was in a different subject than you was there. Whereas I've seen that in, in other schools, you know, sometimes it's it's a bit harder to even find the planning time to do it. I know when I was at a traditional school and I tried to do PBL, I was like meeting with people on weekends and just trying to like, hey, come on guys, do this, do this. Um, And that was a bit of a harder sell. So having the time together, I think was kind of the first starting point just practically. Mm. Then I think a lot of the projects that I've done with with teachers outside of my subject area has just come from where we have the energy. Like, Mm. Like what are we excited about and what do we actually want to pursue with kids? And sometimes it comes from the lens of our subject. Like sometimes there's like, I've had a math science partner who is really excited, for example, about doing, you know, something specific with kids. 
And then we think, okay, how can we actually like form our subjects around this? Mm. But one of my favorite projects, and I think probably the most interdisciplinary one actually came from just the essential question. So we were sitting in the office and my teaching partner was talking about where he was going to send his kid to school. She was going to be five years old. And it was me who was humanities teacher, my partner who was math science, and then we had our art and design teacher. And we were just sitting there like chit-chatting, you know, like our legs up on the table, drinking coffee, like just spending time together. And he was like, I just don't know where to send my kid. Like, Mm -hmm. oh, do I go here, here? Like, what is the perfect school? And all three of us were like, that's awesome. Like, what is the perfect school? Mm. And, and from that, we actually had a project called the Perfect School Project, which was an interdisciplinary project between the three of us. So for us, it came from just this question that we had ourselves. And we thought like this was something that we could put energy into and also could really engage our kids. Okay, so, so the perfect school project is kind of born just a, this epiphany because it's it's a real situation that one of the uh, teachers is facing. So then take me through that because, I mean, that's not necessarily something, obviously it applies to kids because the kids got to find a perfect school, but it's something you guys had generated. How do you then go about, like, do you ensure equal content? Like, and do you look at the project from like each different lens of the subject? Like, how then do you ensure that it's like truly interdisciplinary? And then the second one is like, how do you get, get kids excited about that? Because they weren't necessarily in that, you know, room with it, generate that excitement about the, the school. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the first question about just how did we see our subjects into the question, I think came from looking at this question from the lens of our subjects. So I think, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, you don't need to be a subject expert in project-based learning because you're learning with the kids and blah, blah, blah. But I think that Mm -hmm. when you design a project, you need to know enough about your subject to be able to understand where are these linking connections. So for example, with humanities, I always think about, okay, what books could we read that, that are around this theme? What could we write about that's around this theme? So, I mean, I go into it from the lens of actually the skill in the subject, maybe more than the specific content of the subject. Mm. My teaching partner did the same way. Like the art teacher, she looked at it not necessarily from like an art perspective, but okay, what are the skills and the design process and how can we use art and the way of thinking about art to actually look at this project. So Rob Reardon, who's one of the founders of High Tech High, has this great phrase where he says, like, we need to stop looking at subjects as like a body of knowledge and start looking at them as a lens to see the world. Hmm. So you can look at a question like, what is a perfect school from like a humanities lens? Like then there's so many more possibilities than looking at it from, okay, I need to teach narrative. I need to teach character analysis. How am I going to do that in the perfect school project. So I think that's kind of like the first thing that we started with in this particular project. Okay. So great. So it sounds like, you know, you, you're able to approach it from a different lens. Obviously certain books are going to be appealing to you. Maybe the art and design is going to look at it from like the design aspect of designing that particular school. So what then in terms of like, well, how do you set up or plan those experiences? Cause I think it's quite overwhelming to a lot of teachers, maybe who are watching this to like, okay, so you have a question and you know, you have a different lens like, and then you just let the kids have at it. Like what, what provides the direction for their project? I guess, do they go to their different subjects and then learn according to that lens? Like, what is it, what does that look like then that next step? So practically for this project, we are three teachers and we needed to share the teaching time within this three month period. So the way that this particular project worked is we had an art teacher that was pushing into our project. So we Mm. became a team of three for the whole project. So we had the flexibility to basically take the whole day and between the three of us decide, okay, what's needed for the project today. Mm. So for example, if we were at a point where, especially in the beginning, we had to dig into like, okay, what is school? Like, Mm. what is the purpose of school? What is the history of school, at least from a humanity standpoint? So we would make the schedule and, and determine the time a lot based on just what the project needed. I would say this project, because it was three months, was maybe a bit, yeah, project oriented at the beginning where Mm -hmm. we actually started doing like more, I wouldn't say traditional lessons, but we we engage kids in, in more traditional ways of learning to learn about the topic. And then about halfway through, we kind of opened it up to more of the student-driven project-based learning part of the project. Um, So for the first half of the project, we split the time equally 
So we would have, you know, I would get two hours and then they, the art and design teacher would get two hours and then the math science teacher would get two hours, for example, um, each day. And then based on what we were planning for the project and our subject, we would teach that during that time. But when we opened it up to the actual like making part of the project and where kids were really making these decisions on their own and coming up with their product ideas and going through the actual project-based learning process, they were very much, I think, integrating the subjects all the time. Mm. So we had a, an, a visitor that came in and asked one of my students, like, like, what class are you in right now? Yeah. And the kid actually like looked at him and he was like, I don't know. <laughs> uh-huh. so they had no idea what subject they were actually working with because at that point, like everything had become integrated for them to actually yeah, use it in the project. So, yeah. So, I mean, with this particular project, because it was a quite a big project and it was a long project, we kind of saw our subjects in, in two different ways in those two phases, if that makes sense. Is that so, so in terms of like, if someone's new to this interdisciplinary planning, because I mean, it sounds like it's it's this double-edged sword, right? I mean, one, on one side, you want the kids to go a little bit deep in terms of each subject. So they actually have something to bring to the table when they start the designing. At the same time, you don't want it to be totally contrived where they're just going to their classes. But I mean, would you suggest that for new teachers that they do, you know, structure it a little bit in terms of, you know, what the project is and what the different needs are in the classes? You know, someone who's new to interdisciplinary planning. Yeah, I, I would suggest to do that. I would actually suggest to, to and, and maybe right at the beginning, like maybe the project is divided into like your subjects. So I've also done projects where like I've taught the humanities part and I've had the kids, you know, for half the day and my math science partner has done the math science part and have the kids for half the day. And I think also if you're in a more traditional school where the, the subjects are very fixed, like if you don't have control over the time, for example, I think there's still ways to do great interdisciplinary projects without, you know, opening up time and space to, you know, just being completely blurred. But I think that's kind of the first step is actually just reaching out to a colleague that's not in your subject and saying, okay, how could we think about doing something together? The other thing that I'll just say about this is I think at the beginning, at least what I did is when we had a project that was interdisciplinary, we actually had like two products, Uh, So we had a product that was for like the humanities part and then a product that was for the math science part. And they ended up in the same theme, like, and they fit together at the end, but it also allowed where I could work on the products that my kids were doing in my class. And then my teaching partner could do the same. And that was kind of the first step, I think, to thinking about actually working interdisciplinary. Maybe I should have just started with that. Uh I know. Maybe you're like, what? You got this big question about school and they're just going amok. So, okay. So take me through that one. You said one was your product. One was your product. One was your partner teacher's product. What project was that? And what were the products? Hey, everyone. I hope you're enjoying this interview with my great friend, Lonnie, uh, a guru of interdisciplinary experiences as much as I am. You've heard a bit about the starting point for planning, how to view content as a lens to see the world and how we can really blur the lines between traditional classes and really what a project-based class looks like when we start to just expand our vision of what is possible in an experience. Uh, if you're looking to start your planning for an interdisciplinary project-based experience, I've got a great starting point for you over at www.transformschool.com forward slash uh, PBL starter kit. And that free starter kit is going to give you some case studies. It's going to give you the background on the design process. And whether you're individual or the team, you're going to feel really confident to start planning right away. So be sure to get that. Now, uh, let's get right back into the second half of the interview and we'll hear about Lonnie's dystopia to utopia project and how you can survive the apocalypse. <laughs> Yeah, so one would be um, a project that we did called Dystopia to Utopia, which is about surviving the apocalypse. Okay. And like in humanities class, the kids had to had to develop uh, their own stories about dystopia and how they would survive the apocalypse. And they would, you know, they, they it was much more, I would say, like 
like a traditional humanities project in that way. And then my math science partner, he had the kids making water filters and food cookers and uh, shelters. So again, it was along the same theme, but the products came together at the end. So for the exhibition, the kids showed off their products that they would use to survive the apocalypse. And then they also read stories that they wrote about this dystopian yeah, environment that we created. Okay. And, and I'm, I'm guessing too that like, you're going to get more excited about the uh, whole dystopian portion, you know, as that humanities person and your science teachers, like what's going to be excited is mostly excited about like, let's, you know, build waterfall, let's build like actual like survival contraptions. So I guess it it allows a teacher to really kind of get, you know, into what they're into. Do you feel like sometimes that's forced that you have to have like the humanities, the math science, and that there's some projects that are going to naturally have just a stronger lens of one and that, that, you know, teachers just kind of like, not necessarily on for the ride, but there's in a supportive role more for the project. Like, how many subjects would you say just kind of fit in nicely to a project? I think it depends on the project and it depends on, on the authenticity of the project. Like I think the more authentic an actual problem is, the more opportunities there are for different subjects. Mm. Cause like in the real world, I mean, if I have a challenge, like with my kids, for example, which there are many, uh, if you're a parent, like, it happens. Like, I don't think about it. Okay. Now we, now we have a language problem, you know, and now we have a science problem. I mean, it's just a problem. So like the more authentic the problems actually are that kids are working on, I think the more opportunities there are for interdisciplinary work. But of course, like not every project can be this kind of like major problem, authentic problem solving challenge. So, so I think that some of the more like traditional projects that I think people tend to do at the beginning are actually a bit harder to find these interdisciplinary connections than actually if you go for the big question, like what is the perfect school? So I'm a bit torn between like, of course, it's important to go slow and to, you know, like stretch your comfort level and not jump in completely right away sometimes, but But also sometimes you have to just jump in if you really want to see your subject and the way that that it connects with other things differently. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense because obviously there's a spectrum and it it comes to comfortability. In a perfect world, you're picking this very authentic problem. I mean, you look at right now, it's remote learning, right? I mean, nobody goes, hey, you know, it's remote learning time. Now let's learn about, you know, how we're going to be able to solve this particular dilemma of you know, right. for, from a, through a math lens of how we're like going to prevent the, the spread of coronavirus. It's not like you say, okay, now we're in math class. I mean, these are just something right. like that just come up naturally. So I guess you'd right. probably say that the more authentic, I guess, the problem uh, is, the easier it is then to, you know, for, for teachers to latch on to how it integrates. I think one of the big questions too is like, why do we want kids to do interdisciplinary work? Hmm. You know, and I think that, that of course, there's, there's like a natural push to say like, well, it means that things are more connected, you know, that that there's more like a holistic view of learning. But that holistic view, I think, is only there if the work that they're doing is authentic, you know? So like, there's also like really inauthentic interdisciplinary projects that I've tried where you're like trying to squeeze in all of the subjects. And like, at the end of the day, the kids are just like, why is math in this? Like, it has no, it doesn't really mean anything to it. So, I mean, I, I, again, I think it depends on the school and depends on your own like reasons for doing it. But if the reason is to really Really create more holistic and authentic learning, then I think that that everything about that project needs to be, you know, with with that as the driver, okay. um, rather than just kind of trying to squeeze things together for the sake of squeezing it together. So yeah, let's look at that in terms of like, uh, you know, you do have everybody has like their curriculum, right? And you got your curriculum for humanity, someone's got it for science. So let's say, you know, I'm in this particular project, and it's the uh, the science portion of it. And they're designing these, you know, particular filters and everything else. How, what does assessment look like in this project? Does it look like, hey, I'm going to assess the kids on their science portion and they're going to get a mark on that. And then at the end, it's going to spit out like, here's how they did in science. And now here's how they did in humanities. And you still kind of separate them that way. Or is it according to, you know, the overall project that they get a project grade? What does assessment look like in that in an interdisciplinary kind of scenario? 
Well, when I was teaching middle school, we we took a lot more of like a holistic view, I think, on assessment. So the students were getting like a project grade that was overall for all of the subject content that was in the project. So we did like some some assessments, of course, along the way. And then also at the end of the project, use exhibition as an assessment for this dystopia free to utopia project, for example. Um, And then actually, I think my math science partner might have done like a test actually at the end, just to make sure that that, that content was, was there. Um, and then I use their final products, their final books and stories as a way to, to assess uh, the humanities part. But in, in middle school, they, we actually gave them like a whole project grade based on the knowledge, but then also based on the skills and how they improved and their reflection about the project in general. We also did some group work. Yeah, not grading, I would say, but we, we did use that as a reflection as well for... Yeah or a tool to assess the project. In high school, it got a bit trickier because yeah. in high school, they actually had to receive a grade for the specific subjects. Yeah. So then I would say it became much more about, okay, I have these specific learning goals or things that the students need to get in terms of their humanities content, as well as the skills in humanities. And then we did more traditional assessments, I would say at the end of each project to address the grading in, in uh, high school. Okay, so, I mean, it sounds like when you had the stories like the kids wrote for those dystopian stories, I'm assuming that that there's, there's quite a, a lot of standards that you can assess through that. And even if, yes, you did pump out a project grade, it seems like that'd be easy to still differentiate or separate that into like that. This yeah. is your humanities grade, like, you know, in terms of their story structure, organization, or, you know, ability, word choice, like all these things. So I'm, um, yeah, I'm curious as to then, you know, in high school, yes, you do have to report out uh, individually for the subjects, but could you still do that through whatever the project artifacts are that, you know, that they're producing? Isn't that? Yeah, thing? totally. So, so in the perfect school project, for example, is ninth grade. And it was a little bit trickier because the final products weren't necessarily separated out to subjects. I mean, they, mm-hmm. they had a one massive final project that they needed to complete. So, so from, for, from a product standpoint, that became a little more challenging. And actually the assessments along the way, the points that they were getting along the way made more sense in terms of, yeah, assessing learning, but also just giving a grade uh, mm-hmm. for the project. Um, but we still were able to pick it out in the sense that, that we had an idea of where our subject uh, content knowledge was coming in to the product, for example, so we could use the products in some ways. Okay. And yeah. what, what was the product then for that one? Like I'm trying to, is it a, a perfectly designed school? Like is it a model of a school with like, and how it works and final products, um, they, they actually constructed a whole school as a team. So they actually had to go through this process as a whole team of figuring out what the perfect school was. And then they needed to create uh, different parts of the school in smaller groups using a 3D printer and AutoCAD. And then they needed to also design specific curriculum for the classes and for the, the different parts of the school. And then we created a handbook for the school. So they called it Ohana High after I think Lilo and Stitch was the, uh, movie that was kind of popular then, but it means like nobody's left behind. So the whole uh, purpose of the school was actually built around this family element. Then from the math science part, they looked at sustainability. So the school had to have features around sustainability and environmental concerns and, and all of this. Um, so the massive one project at the end was this huge model that took up like the whole classroom of the perfect school. And then they also had, you know, some writing pieces and things like that that went along with explaining what the school was. Wow. Okay. So take me through what was just unexpected? Like, I'm sure you obviously expected as part of this teachers to be like, all right, they're gonna have some kind of design of a school and, and share it. What were the unexpected things that came up that like where the students took the project where you would have had no idea, you know? Planning? Yeah, well, I mean, we thought that they would take this opportunity and just create this like totally innovative, like crazy hands-on, you yeah. know, like kind of school. Like we were prepared for a school in a tree or like, I mean, they could do anything. And they actually really liked some traditional things <laughs> to like kind of push them. So like one of the classes, for example, they're like, well, we want lectures in this. Like we think it's really important to actually have lectures. And we were like, wait a minute, this is totally not 
you know, <laughs> what? But, but then it was like, well, we actually have to listen. I mean, we're giving them the voice and the platform to design their perfect school. Like we have to just let them go with it. But what actually emerged more than any kind of innovative pedagogical approach was that this importance of family and feeling connected to each other. Mm-hmm. They also created dorms at the school. So kids that were having a rough home life or needed a place to stay, if their family life, like for a night was just overwhelming, they could come to the school and live there for yeah, a night or a year or whatever. So like they were very like very much taking in this like personal connection part of school, which we actually of course, we know it's important, but we were actually focused a lot more on like the pedagogy in the school and how it was being taught in the classes that would be offered. But for the kids, that was nearly as important as this community and family feel. Mm, all right. So that was really unexpected. Cool. Well, that's and that's something it's, it's something good for us to, to know, you know, and for everyone who's watching this to know is that like there are certain parts of the design that, you know, you uh, you you know that you want to assess, you know, they wanted to get and there's some things that are unexpected and you went with it rather than, you know, necessarily trying to force the issue. And I think that's oftentimes quite hard as a teacher to kind of, you know, stand back and not try to like, you know, somehow influence things. If you were to uh, go back to your like, you know, young self, knowing what you know now about like, I guess, working with the team and interdisciplinary planning on projects, like what is like the best piece of advice you would have given your like young self? Good question. Yeah, I think one of the biggest things was actually to, to trust my colleagues. You know, when you are working on a project with other people, especially outside of your discipline, you have to give up control. Like if you're doing this project that takes, you know, expertise from other people, like you can't control everything. And I think I came from a a traditional school where I was the master of my own classroom and, you know, I didn't really have to share a whole lot or, you know, give up control. And then to go into the situation where, I mean, half of the project is dependent on someone else Mm. in a way. Yeah. Um, that, that, that requires a lot of trust, you know? And, and I think sometimes in interdisciplinary projects, I could feel that I would start to panic a bit and yeah. want to take over that control from a colleague, even though I maybe loved and really respected them. Um, so I think I would have told myself that, that, you know, true collaboration is really about letting go. And when you do interdisciplinary projects, it's kind of the, the, the highest point of realization of that you know, you have to just relax and let it go. Wow. Luckily, the people I were working was working with most of the time were just awesome people. And we got along really well. And we just had a lot of fun together. And I think that would also be the other thing is like, don't stress out, just have fun, you know, yeah. and the kids will have fun if you're, if you're all having fun with it. That's got to be huge. I, I actually want you somehow to like, if we can go back in a time machine with one of the teams I was on dealing with difficult team members, because I don't know, maybe you have some tips for me because you said that thing about letting go. And I think that must be, it's so hard when you get a bunch of teachers who are a bit of control freaks, kind of like, you know, my bit, myself included, and like who are really, really dead set. I mean, we have, I've thought back to some of my team members. I did not know how to like somehow like, you know, the, the person was just inflexible, like would not be yeah. really rigid. And so I guess maybe it's a culture thing, right? I mean, it's a culture that has to be established and you can't just jump into interdisciplinary planning and expect it to go well. You said that trust thing is it's big, probably knowing how to communicate, I guess, with your team members and, and yeah. how you build that trust, right? Because I'm sure some people build that trust by like, hey, being open to new ideas like you are, but some are like, uh, if we're too open to new ideas, I don't trust you. Like, I don't, I don't have the confidence that we're going to actually be able to follow through with this. So. Yeah. Um, it's really tough too. I mean, it depends a lot on the personalities and the culture of the school, but it also, I think sometimes depends on the number. Like, I mean, at high tech high, we had, you know, one teaching partner, we worked in a team of three, sometimes, sometimes a little bit larger groups. But when I see teams that are attempting interdisciplinary projects with like six people, yeah. like my heart starts to pump and I'm like, oh, <laughs> I just don't know if this is going to work. Um, so I think it's it's about the the chemistry of the team, but it's also, I think, about the number. So I, I wouldn't actually advise that people jump into a team of six and try to work on an interdisciplinary project mm. right away. Like, I think one other person that you really trust and have fun with is a great way to start. And then building on that is, is a good way to get started with it. Yeah, I think that's an absolute nugget if you're listening to this. And, you know, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, We jumped from a three-person team to a seven-person team with planning. And you just immediately see, you immediately see, I mean, it's harder to make decisions, right? Yes, you get more input. 
but it's very slow. It's very slow moving and things just get messy. And I almost feel like that's what happens when we start to schedule and we start to like, you know, because then we're like, all right, now we have seven people to schedule somehow and get equal coverage. And then we get schools, you know, we don't get there what it's supposed to be. Yeah. So yeah, I would, I would echo that what Lonnie said, anything, uh, else that you want to, I used to, how about let's, let's do one more thing. I used to think, but now I know and that's like a high tech high thing. <laughs> we'll end with that. If we, if you don't have one, we don't have to end with that. We can end with like a high five or something. <laughs> I used to think, but now I know. I think I used to think that the, I think I used to really strive a lot for planning projects with other people and having them be interdisciplinary. And I still think that they're the very best projects I've ever done are ones that have put in that work. But now I think it's better to do less and do it better. So I would say rather than try to plan every project being interdisciplinary because it takes a lot of effort and coordination that, that actually to go where the energy is. And if the project comes up and it's authentic and it has these great connections, then go with it. But actually to try to force <laughs> some of this stuff um, actually creates, I think, a bit more of a challenge than a benefit for student okay. learning. I right. think that's my big... Less is more. Learning. Yeah. Keep it simple. All right. Well, yeah. thanks, Lonnie. And uh, yeah, no I guess people could probably get a hold of you through uh, email if they want to know more. Yeah. Yeah, totally fine. Or you. Okay. <laughs>